SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker, Trevor Harrison, to you. Trevor is a professor at the University of Lethbridge, a professor of sociology, I believe, at the University of Lethbridge, and he's very well known to us. He's an author of many books, uh, founder of the Parkland Institute, and you'll see him on TV all the time because everybody likes his opinion. So today he's going to give us one on how Daniel Smith became Premier and what that means for us in Alberta. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you so much, uh, Colleen. Uh, whether they like my opinion, I think they, they are just, I'm so photogenic, I think that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and they can't get, Ooh, apparently they can't get Dwayne Bratt on every occasion, so I'm kind of the default person. So. Um, it is really nice to, uh, to be here. Uh, I actually, uh, out of curiosity, I looked up this morning uh, how many times I presented at SACPA in the past. I've been in Lethbridge since 2002. This is the 13th time. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's always been uh, great fun. It's been uh, invigorating. I enjoy actually going out to, to talk with uh, people in the, uh, the community. I think it's actually a, a duty and a responsibility of people in academia to do that. Uh, this is kind of wavering in and out. Is the sound? Knut is trying to fix it. Okay. I will just continue anyway. Um, so I do think it's a, a responsibility of academics to actually reach out from academia to talk to the community. So uh, again, I'm really pleased to come here. And SACPA is just a wonderful organization, so it, it deserves everybody's support. <laughs> So my talk today is going to be on Daniel Smith. There are many things I could obviously talk about, uh, about the UCP, Jason Kenney, Canada as a whole, etc. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but I'm going to kind of narrowly talk about Daniel Smith because she's very much in the, the news right now uh, as our new premier, a newly elected member for the legislature as of a couple of days ago. Uh, I will say actually that some of what I'm going to present today actually comes out of a book that I am co-editing. Uh, the final title yet needs to be uh, uh, done, but it's the, the main title is going to be something like Anger and Angst. And I think that describes exactly what we've gone through over the last number of years and explains a lot about what is actually the politics of Alberta. Uh, and some of what I'm going to actually uh, speak on, I will actually read from a section of a introductory chapter that uh, I just have been working on the last few days, dealing specifically with uh, Daniel Smith. So, with no more ado, I'm going to uh, go to the next slide here. I don't have a lot of pictures, so apologies for that. I'm a sociologist, not a tech person, I you can tell immediately. <laughs> Uh, so I've put up here a short bio on uh, Daniel Smith, uh, and, and the reason uh, I'm not going to go over it in detail because that would take up a lot of time as it, as it is. Uh, she was uh, born, however, in Calgary in 1971, uh, so she's 51 years old at this point. Uh, has lived most of her life, uh, from what I can tell, in Alberta. Uh, her training was at the University of uh, Calgary, where she got uh, BAs both in English and in economics. Uh, there she was very much influenced by what is referred to as the Calgary School of Ac Academics. That includes people like uh, Tom Flanagan in political science, uh, Reiner Knopf also in political science, Ted Morton, uh, who also is a former finance minister of Alberta, and uh, a number of others. Uh, and uh, most of these uh, academics, they're very conservative, certainly right of center, and uh, she's highly influenced uh, by them. 
she also uh, will herself describe herself as a uh, libertarian populist, and I'll get into that a little bit more as well. Her intellectual uh, influences uh, are uh, people like Friedrich Hayek, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, and Ayn Rand, uh, and that's where her fairly extreme libertarianism, I think, comes out of. Um, she has been, over the years, a, uh, um, a lobbyist for various organizations, uh, of course, at one point, she became the leader of the Wild Rose Party. Uh, and in 2012, looking like she was actually going to uh, become premier of the province, uh, at the last moment, a lot of people panicked. And uh, over a number of reasons, uh, the extreme comments of some of the Wild Rose candidates. Also, uh, many people would suggest that uh, Smith's own lack of a uh, program or policy around climate change hurt her. In fact, she seemed to be quite a climate change skeptic at that time. And this probably scared a lot of people in some of the urban centers. Uh, the outcome of that was uh, a rather mixed thing. Wild Rose became the opposition, but uh, failed in becoming actually the uh, governing party of Alberta, much to many people's surprise. Um, Two years later, uh, she pulled off uh, what is a historic uh, thing in uh, Canadian politics. She, along with eight other members of the Wild Rose Party, went across the floor and joined Jim Prentice's uh, party. So the first time ever that an opposition leader, whose first and foremost task is to actually oppose, said, I don't oppose what the governing party is doing, so I'm just going to collapse this into one party. Um, this did not spell uh, very well for her career, and she uh, left uh, politics altogether after the uh, 2015 election and became a, a, a media personality uh, talk show host with QR77 in Calgary. Uh, I will tell you over the years, actually, I have listened to QR77 a lot particularly when I was driving back and forth between Edmonton and Calgary on my parkland work. Uh, and I would catch her show on any number of occasions. And so I, I'm very familiar with her uh, opinions on a number of things. And I'll talk about some of those in a while here. Uh, but my knowledge of uh, Smith doesn't come over just the last few weeks. I've actually listened to her for a long time. So she built up her reputation. And I would suggest actually rebuilt her uh, her reputation through being a media personality beginning in 2015 up until when she left in early 2021. She owns a restaurant in, uh, uh, in um, uh, High River. Uh, I haven't eaten there yet, but if I ever am passing through, perhaps I'll drop in. Uh, and in the last uh, few months, of course, she finally announced her candidacy for the uh, UCP party, won that on October 6th against six other candidates, and then two days ago uh, won a by-election in Brooks Medicine Hat. <coughs> Uh, a little bit about the campaign itself. Uh, there were seven cam uh, candidates for it. Three of them only really were taken seriously from the beginning as uh, observers thought who was likely to come out. That was Brian Jean, who had rebuilt the Wild Rose Party after uh, Smith had uh, collapsed it in 2014, uh, and uh, Taves and Smith. Uh, much of Smith's uh, agenda and much of the UCP candidates' agenda, it seems to me, is focused on anger at various groups, hence the title of the, uh, the book coming out. Uh, familiar attacks on all kinds of external enemies of Alberta, and this goes back a long ways. Alberta has a long political history of focusing on various enemies going back to the 1920s. Uh, some of those have been added to over the last few years. So there's the tradition of talking about Laurentian elites, something I could talk about a little bit more, very peculiar kind of historic document or idea. 
to this has been added during COVID, the uh, AHS, who Daniel Smith has a particular hate on for, and then international organizations. Uh, so regularly you'll hear about the United Nations and its various branches, the World Economic Forum, who many people would not have even heard of until just a very few uh, weeks ago uh, or months ago, and the World Health Organization. Uh, so these also have been added to what is argued to be a globalist conspiracy. Smith's main uh, uh, policy or uh, argument throughout the campaign was for something called a free Alberta strategy, that Alberta is highly oppressed by all these various enemies. And as part of that, the Sovereignty Act. Again, I won't go into the Sovereignty Act in detail, but suffice to say, many people have said that whatever that Sovereignty Act is, is likely to be unconstitutional and uh, simply will not fly, whether or not it gets out of the legislature itself. There are aspects of uh, the Sovereignty Act that go back to social credit, uh, when social credit attempted to assert an independence from Ottawa that was later found invalid by the Supreme Court. Uh, but it also uh, harkens to uh, an idea of coming up from the United States that goes back to the uh, just before the American Civil War, and that's the idea of nullification. Some of you may know that the uh, Civil War in the United States was, uh, in some sense, a fight between uh, centralized authority and states' rights. And so the southern states basically argued that they should be able to do uh, and exert themselves from any federal laws whatsoever. Uh, and uh, the Civil War was very much fought over this. Many of Smith's uh, Mentors are, in fact, American academics, and so they seem themselves to be quite enamored of the idea of nullification, that Alberta can just simply nullify federal laws and proceed on its own as though it is an independent province. Uh, one of the things that Smith very successfully was able to do was to move the agenda for the leadership race uh, in one direction. That is, very quickly, almost everybody, even though many of the candidates uh, uh, criticized the Sovereignty Act, very quickly what you saw were people like uh, Lowen and Jean uh, and uh, others come up with their own policy suggestions that said we're basically Al we're Alberta firsters. Uh, so it's almost like there was kind of a loyalty uh, thing that was required that all of the candidates had to say, we're standing up for Alberta. Uh, and this very much played to Smith's own uh, approach in terms of the politics. So no more kind of middle of the road kind of attempts to uh, get over any amount of anger. We're going to ramp it up again. Anti-Ottawa, anti-liberal, anti-Central Canada, anti-Laurentian elites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this kind of fight, there's no way that Smith was going to lose. Coming out of a media background uh, and her own background uh, period, uh, Smith is by far the best street fighter of the bunch of them. The rest of them simply did not know how to counter the kind of politics that she was preaching. Um, and a kind of no holds barred approach to politics. And you can see it actually just in the very few days, uh, almost month, since she became uh, premier and now in the last two days since she got a seat. Politics is going to get incredibly nasty over the next six months uh, in this province because Daniel Smith is a street fighter. And you have to understand that in terms of how she approaches politics. There is no compromise. This is going to be a fight to the death uh, in her vision of what Alberta looks like or should look like. <coughs> a little bit about the leadership and the by-election votes. Uh, the UC UCP leadership itself is, makes up a very small portion of the Alberta population about 3.5%. Uh, much of that membership, there's some excellent analyses done by uh, Jason Markasoff and others. Uh, the, uh, much of that membership comes from southern Alberta, 
uh, south of Red Deer. Uh, as you see here, uh, very f uh, only 41% of the popula of the membership comes from Edmonton or Calgary, where, of course, the bulk of Albertans actually live. Uh, the uh, final decision actually came down to six ballots. This was a little bit longer than uh, people who are examining the uh, what was going to happen thought it would take. Uh, six ballots at the end, Smith does win uh, with not quite 54% of the membership vote. Um, as some people commented, actually about 2% more only than Jason Kenney got in his defense of his leadership in the spring. Uh, ultimately, Smith's vote uh, in terms of the membership represents about 1.5% of Alberta's electorate, which makes up about 2.7, 2.8 million voters. Um, but Smith was not appealing to that wide electorate. You know, the first, first thing is win the leadership. So all of Smith's attention was focused on winning the leadership. And that meant appealing to a uh, membership base that is very singular in its particular approach to politics and its anger, particularly coming out of COVID. The by-election just held two days ago is also just very quickly worth noting. Uh, By-elections do not generally get many people out to vote. In this case, it fell a little bit short of 30%. That's low even by by-election standards. Um, but it's also really surprising because if anything would get people out to vote, you would think is we're going to be voting for someone to be our representative who is premier of the province. So that should have been a kind of incentive for people to actually come out. Still less than 30%. Uh, Smith does win the by-election with 54.5% of the vote, uh, but that's about 6% less than the UCP candidate won in 2019, won with in 2019, and the, the turnout then was actually about 66%. But an interesting thing is the uh, Smith actually lost in the uh, districts of Medicine Hat itself. So there's a, an interesting thing going on in terms of small, mid-sized cities and the rural areas around there that I'll get into a little bit more. So who is Daniel Smith? Um, at this point, I'm going to read just a, uh, a section quickly from the uh, one couple of pages of uh, introductory chapter that I've been working on. Smith's occupation, occupational career can best be described as that of a serial lobbyist and media personality. Her chief ability seems that of convincing others of her abilities. In politics, however, ambitions and promises have often fallen short of actual performance. Ideologically, she is a committed right-wing libertarian for whom freedom trumps equality, markets trump politics, and democracy is little more than an exercise in populist <coughs> agitation and manipulation. Her actions since becoming premier and centralizing power within her office suggests an authoritarian streak. Many of the ministers actually, uh, their policies, everything must go through her office. So she's very much centralizing all decision making in herself. Smith is a clever wordsmith and described by many as intelligent, but she has not shown herself to be a critical thinker. Instead, she seems wedded to novelty for novelty's sake. She is generally dismissive of experts, except when their ideas validate what she already believes. In the words of journalist Graham Thompson, she is, quotes, noted for constructing a worldview based on anecdotal evidence, confirmation bias, and bad choices. Befitting a talk radio host, Smith has a lot of opinions. In an Ask Me Anything broadcast in June 2021, Smith said, I literally have an opinion on everything. <laughs> But her opinions often lack evidence. The examples are multitude. In 20, 2003, while columnist for the Calgary Herald, she cited tobacco-funded research that smokers of just three to four cigarettes a day have no increased risk of lung cancer, coronary heart disease, bronchitis, or emphysema. That last part is a quote from her. Her particular focus on cancer was repeated during the 20, uh, 2022 leadership race when she implied that everything up to stage four in that diagnosis is completely within an individual's capacity to control. In the midst of a massive bee-free call due to E. coli con contamination in 2012, 
Smith, at the time still Wild Rose leader, claimed that thoroughly cooking the meat would kill the bacteria and that it could be fed to those in need. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she used her radio show, newsletters, and podcasts to criticize health restrictions and the science behind them and to promote debunked treatments such as hydroxychloroquine and intermectin, for which the radio station disciplined her. Smith's over-the-top rhetoric has continued ever since winning the UCP leadership. During a media scrum immediately after her swearing in ceremony as premier, Smith declared the unvaccinated were, quotes, the most discriminated against group that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime, having faced restrictions on their freedoms based on having made a medical choice. Smith later said she would amend the human, Alberta Human Rights Act to protect the rights of those refusing to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and mused about a possible blanket amnesty for anyone charged with violating public health restrictions. She also accused Alberta Health Services of manufacturing staff shortages and being in cahoots with the World Economic Forum. So what does a Smith Premiership mean for Alberta? And Brian Jean actually during the leadership race said, uh, the best predictor of what uh, someone is going to do is what they've done in the past. And so I think we can take actually Daniel Smith at her word in terms of many of the policies she's likely to pursue. Uh, she is likely to uh, ramp up even the anger that Jason Kenney at times uh, ventured against the uh, federal government. But we can expect even more confrontations with Ottawa uh, over pretty much everything. Anything that Ottawa, that the Liberals say she's going to be opposed to. Um, she will water down the Sovereignty Act, which to some extent to try to make it actually saleable so it is slightly more bulletproof from lawyers. That is risky for her because some of her supporters don't want it watered down at all. There are many who are actually fairly avowedly separatist, who really want Alberta to be an independent state. We can also safely predict chaos in the health system. Uh, much of Smith's focus over the years has always been on health issues, as many of the examples I gave uh, suggest. Uh, more privatization, and if not privatization, actually outsourcing. This is, this is an interesting one where a lot of conservative governments have basically said we will accept public funding, but the fu public funding now must go to private entities. So it's a way of actually laundering public money into private hands. Uh, so they can get around and say, yeah, we still have a public system, but it's going to be very expensive because you're going to sign contracts with private uh, providers. More administration. Uh, Smith's uh, decision to basically go back to a whole series of different regions again is likely to mean more administrative costs. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a study come, uh, came out, and I can't remember actually who did, I might have been KPMG, uh, a s national study of healthcare costs across Canada. And guess what? Alberta actually has the lowest administrative costs. Uh, percentage-wise of any province in Canada. And yet the argument is always there's a lot of fat in the system, there's too many administrators. The reason it's so low is because they actually centralized a lot of functions. Uh, and so by going back to all the different regions again, and it's kind of like an accordion, <laughs> let's open it up, let's close it up, let's open it. That's what conservative governments have done here for the last 35 years is keep messing around with the health system. Anyway, you're likely to see even more costs administratively and generally more costs in the long run. But again, it, it will look like it's coming out of the public system. The Provincial governments, by the way, right now are wanting more money from the federal government. The federal government is actually saying we don't want to give you more money right now because we've given you money, but the other thing is we've actually given you uh, tax points that if you wanted more money, you could actually tax. Alberta doesn't want to tax. They just want more money from Ottawa that they can launder through uh, the public system to private hands. We can also expect a lot of rhetoric and concern over inflation. 
We've seen that in the last couple of days in terms of the, uh, the mandate letters sent out to, uh, to uh, the various uh, departments, ministries. Uh, whether or not this is actually effective, but it looks good. Because obviously people are concerned about inflation. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, the cost of everything has been going up. And so th the main thing that politicians can always do is rhetorically say, we're listening to you and we're going to do something. Um, more money and promises to, uh, to voters, especially in Calgary and rural areas. They've pretty much written off Edmonton. Um, but Calgary is going to be the battleground for the election. Uh, and you can also expect happy lawyers. Uh, lawyers are going to be very happy over the next couple of years, uh, particularly if, if Daniel Smith and UCP wins, because many of the things simply will not fly. But they sound good, and uh, given that it's six months out, even if you win an election on things that are eventually thrown out, it doesn't really matter because you won the election. Uh, and meanwhile, the lawyers will be happy. This actually goes back again to social credit, of course, where uh, social credit promised a bunch of things in 1935 that were eventually ruled invalid. So then we have a May election, maybe, and there are some people said, have, are saying, what if the UCP is still really down in the polls? Will uh, Daniel Smith, uh, as is her constitutional right, put it off for another year? Some people wonder. Uh, her calculus is, as I'll just suggest here, to win all of the rural seats and then a few in the cities. But this is complicated, as I just said, by that by-election. Uh, because Alberta no longer, and I used to work doing a lot of surveys at the University of Alberta, we always used to say it's Edmonton, Calgary, and the rest. But pollsters now realize increasingly it's Edmonton, Calgary, small, mid-sized cities, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Grand Prairie, Red Deer, and the rest, right? And the politics are not exactly the, the same there. The calculation that you win the rural areas in a few seats in Calgary and you're home free may not actually work for them. The other thing is, as uh, a, a poll this morning was suggesting, again from Janet Brown, a lot of Albertans are getting really tired of just endlessly fighting over and over and over again and saying Ottawa did it to us, right? It, it wears a bit thin after a while. Yeah. One final prediction. I don't, I'm not usually given to predictions uh, very firmly, but this one I'm pretty firm about. Daniel Smith will disappoint her supporters and members of cabinet who will eventually at some point turn on her because this is what the conservative party uh, in their various names have done repeatedly to all their leaders for well over a decade now. They did it to Klein. They did it to Stelmack, they did it to Redford. They're going to do it again to Daniel Smith after having it done it already to Jason Kenney. So she can wait for that moment when the knock on the door comes and says, go back to broadcasting again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for a very thought-provoking administration, and, or administration, sorry, <laughs> for a very thought-provoking I'm trying to talk. avoid that, by the way. <laughs> um, we're going to open it up for questions from the uh, floor. I'm going to ask you to please state your name and keep your introduction short so we can give Trevor time um, to respond. Please come over to the left, and then you can come up here to answer your questions. Um, I'll start with Haley. Hi, Trevor. Henning Mundel here. Um, you didn't talk much about the NDP. <laughs> you managed to make a prediction here. Would you predict the outcome of the coming election? <laughs> no. If all the questions are as easy as that to answer, I'm, I'm really going to have an easy time here. Uh, Maureen Hawkins. Maureen, can you go to the mic? 
Okay. Maureen Hawkins. Uh, my question is, do you anticipate that Danielle Smith will continue Kenny's attack on post-secondary education and on the destruction of cognitive thinking in K-12? to <laughs> Well, the uh, clearest signal of that is that uh, Danielle Smith, when she named her cabinet, by the way, the largest cabinet by far in Canadian history, 38 people. Uh, some of them are, are sub-ministers to other ministers, but 38 people. Uh, and many of the people who are appointed as uh, the heads of their ministries are the same people that were there under Jason Kenney. And that, you know, so that's post-secondary, of course, Lagrange in K-12. to And so I would expect the policies will continue very much the same way. Uh, so I don't think post-secondary can expect any kind of uh, relief. Um, the Kenny government did not like post-secondary, uh, and uh, there's no sign that Daniel Smith, remember I said Daniel Smith does not like experts. Uh, and many people in the party do not like experts because they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. They're, you know, whatever, they're making it up. So, yeah, sadly no relief for post-secondary. My name is Frances Schultz. Thank you, Trevor. I always, always have to be at your talks. Anyway, what I would like to ask, because I heard her on the radio yesterday saying that she was going to increase ACE payments and she was going to do some, some of the kinds of things that only happen with the NDP. Do you think she's going to try and steal a few good ideas from the NDP and pretend that she's changed? <laughs> well, uh, just as a, a, a note for that, uh, in fact, during the leadership race, um, uh, Taves also said that if uh, he was the leader, he was going to roll that back. He was going to bring back the, uh, uh, for the AISH payments that they, in, in fact, would not be, you know, would be inflation protected. So it's an idea that, that she's just latch on to as well. But yeah, what they're trying to do right now basically is make friends with people, uh, you know, they can't win over all their obdurate enemies, but they want to make friends with people who they have annoyed over the last while. And so you'll see a lot of money going out to various groups. So yeah, it's more money to ACE, we want to show that we are, are a kinder, gentler uh, regime. Uh, money for things such as uh, training for firefighters, right? You heard that the other day? Whole bunch of different things. The money is just going to be flowing because, of course, right now, Alberta, because the price of oil has gone up, they have money to spend over the next few months. So to put a different face on the party really costs nothing but provides the potential benefit of actually getting elected. So, um, but at the heart, once an election is over with, what you're going to see is privatization, low taxes, and moving the province in a further right-wing direction. Uh, Terry Shellington is my name. Uh, Trevor, I've been musing about the <clears throat> similarities and differences between Jason Kenney and, um, and um, Danielle Smith. Uh, it was said about Jason Kenney that he was always fighting with somebody, whether it was the ambulance drivers or the teachers or the nurses or the doctors. And Rachel said one time he, he heads out each day wondering, well, who can I fight with today? Um, Daniel Smith, in contrast, seems, but he, he seemed to be unquestionably a Canadian. Daniel Smith uh, seems to pick her fights not with the constituent parts of the province, but with um, the big powers of whatever. Uh, do you care to comment? Yeah, there are uh, similarities and differences between the two of them. Um, Jason Kenney has uh, also been described in the past as a libertarian, but it's a libertarianism that is uh, textured by f traditional conservatism and to some extent a, uh, a calculus that is, is political. So when Jason Kenney was picking on various enemies, uh, they were enemies that he knew would sell well with his party and with, his, with the party's base. Um, but I think Jason Kenney also is astute enough as a politician to 
realize that there's only perhaps certain uh, some ways that you can go. Uh, Daniel Smith is in some ways even more ideological than Jason Kenney is and she is much more committed to uh, libertarianism than, than Jason Kenney is. Uh, I think she is by her background much more of an Albertan. In this province much like in Quebec the big fight is for the heart and minds of people. Are you for your province or are you for the country as a whole, for, for Canada? And there's a, a number of people in Alberta, most people are still see themselves as Canadians first, Albertans second, or at least they're equal. But there is a portion that is very much Alberta firsters and maybe Alberta's only. Uh, and so I think Daniel Smith is somewhere towards that and not so much as, as you said, Jason Kenny you also uh, spoke repeatedly of being a Canadian as well. Hello, my name is Liberty Blair Karasage. Um, I kind of feel a little bit awkward because I think the lady um, before or me basically asked my question before um, I got to ooh, the um, mic. But essentially, I kind of um, work in kind of um, social care. Like I work at the Interfaith Food Bank, and I see a lot of of the um, people who are of lower incomes and people who are kind of um, vulnerable, uh, like uh, vulnerable economically. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, I'm, this is a very ignorant question, um, but like what are we going to see in that kind of, you know, world or that aspect of kind of um, Alberta, um, uh, like a Alberta lifestyle or Al uh, of Alber Alberta. Um, if we can just say kind of like, basically like the answer to the previous question, that's, that's totally cool. But if you want to like add on to anything of the previous question, please go. Thanks for the uh, question, Liberty, and, and there is no question that is uh, stupid at all. Uh, the, uh, what can you expect in terms of kind of social service stuff? Uh, as I said, I think the party is going to want to put a kinder, more gentler uh, face on. But one of the things, because uh, Daniel Smith believes firmly that private markets, she again is a libertarian of, of a right-wing type, the private markets uh, are the solution to everything. Right, that, that in fact government is really a problem. Government programs are a pr problem. Public services are a problem. They would be, everything should be run privately. So what you can expect is that a lot of privatization, even of stuff like uh, childcare, <clears throat> many aspects of uh, uh, children's services, along with health, etc., cetera, uh, that, that's the direction she's going to go. The idea being that it's, it's a trickle-down kind of thing. We get private operators to do these things, get government out of the way, and everything is going to resolve itself. Uh, does this help people who are poor and uh, doing, not doing very well? I'm very skeptical about that. But the people who are operating these businesses are going to do very well. They are not going to be poor and out in the cold. Hi, Trevor. Ken Sears. Um, the last thing you said, the last point you made was that there, you expected, fully expected there to be an attack on Danielle Smith from within her own party sometime in the immediate future, or the medium term. Uh, the question I guess I have is, and it's an unfair question because I'm asking you to forecast, what side of the UCP party do you would you be least surprised to see the attacks begin from? <laughs> that is actually a really difficult question. Uh, remember, the UCP is an amalgam of at least two different factions. And that was Wild Rose and the old Conservative Party. Um, parties in general like to win. That's why they're created. And so if they sniff that somebody is a loser, they get rid of them really quickly. And in Alberta, they do it really quickly. Um, Smith's in a, a bit of a dilemma because some of her more strident statements played to that very uh, extreme Wild Rose base. And to some extent now, I'd say the party really is the Wild Rose party. They finally, after 2012, 12, have finally taken over. 
but she also needs to appeal because she wants to get into Calgary. Um, and so there's kind of a corporate old Tory base. Can she work with them? Some of them, them are, I suspect, very concerned about some of her statements driving off investment in the province. And this came up when the talk about the Sovereignty Act uh, was, uh, was flying. Um, but she does have very good corporate connections. In fact, I said she's a serial lobbyist, and there's an interesting story, if you haven't read it, it's in both the Globe and Mail, the Lethbridge Herald, and the Calgary Star today, uh, about her tight connections with uh, it's a, the Alberta Enterprise Group or whatever. It's a lobby group for the biggest organizations. And they clearly are anticipating that they, she will throw lots of money their way, that she will stimulate the economy and then do well. Many of those are in Calgary. So she has an inroads with them, but she doesn't totally sell with a lot of the people there as well. So she's got to straddle uh, some very difficult um, groups there to make them all happy. My guess is uh, that if anybody is least happy with her at some point, it may well be the the uh, the Wild Rose voters who have shown themselves in the past to quite uh, quickly turn on their leaderships. Uh, Maria Fitzpatrick, uh, thank you for your presentation, Trevor. Uh, you mentioned perception. And uh, a number of years ago, I had a conversation with John Baird when they were doing their um, create chaos and uh, privatize. And uh, I challenged him on it. And he said, um, it isn't that we actually do anything. It's that our, the, our supporters perceive that we're doing something. And it seems that that's what she's doing. So how can we counter that? Mm. Well, in, in some ways, that's a, I could go on at length about there's a, an issue here in politics generally. I, I think we are beset by politicians who do use a lot of rhetoric and don't do anything. I mean, the fact is, actually, this planet is, is, has faces some real serious crises from war, climate change, growing inequality, um, uh, all kinds of things out there. Uh, so rhetoric isn't going to just to snow you so that I can win an election doesn't solve the problem. So I think we should hold all politicians m much more firmly to answering the question and telling us what they're going to do and what is the logic behind why you think it will work. <laughs> Where's the evidence for presenting these kinds of arguments? We let politicians off the hook way too easily, and because Daniel Smith is trained as a as a media personality, she knows how to do that. Right? She learned, spent all those years figuring out how to manipulate language. Um, and if you start to cut through what she and many other politicians say, it's just fluff. <laughs> so we need to actually, as citizens, uh, demand better of our politicians. Leona Jacobs. So um, in the spirit of talking about what will happen to social services, I'm going to change it up a bit and say, what do you think will be happening to our environment, specifically the eastern slopes and the abandoned oil well situation? Mm. And I know that our star is in there too, so. What wonderful question, as I would expect, Leona. They, well, in fact, the minister actually did say the other day they were not going to revisit the issue around coal. Yeah. Uh, and we will see it. Again, this, is this just something thrown out to people to appease a particular group that they really annoyed? We'll see. On the other hand, the fact is that coal doesn't seem to be uh, going forwards a really saleable commodity. So there are some bigger things going on with that. The orphan wells thing is a really interesting because I said about uh, Daniel Smith's lobbying efforts. She was lobbying for, uh, as one of the things she wanted to do was for uh, oil and gas companies to be given a royalty break to clean up orphan wells. Now, 
those oil and gas companies received a royalty break in the first place because they pay very little over years and uh, all the other benefits they get and now all of a sudden they're going to get an even more of a break to clean up wells which they were supposed to have cleaned up in the first place. <laughs> so it, it looks to me like the Alberta taxpayer is going to be on the hook two or three times over for something that companies were supposed to do. But she lobbied for that as a lobbyist outside of government and now she's talking about it as a politician. So she's bringing in, that's why I said the things she's talked about already are predictive of what she's going to do. She is, as Premier, going to bring in a policy to let companies off the hook for doing what they should have done in the first place. Hi, Barb Sears. Um, I was wondering if how the situation will go with between is it Rachel Harder, is it Thomas? I can't, Thompson, whatever, and and Daniel Smith, um, putting them in loggerheads possibly um, with uh, separatist ideas and opting out of government, uh, federal, regula you know, figure, figure, federal things. Anyway, there should be some kind of interesting thing going on there and somebody's gonna be in hot water, I think. <laughs> Well, one, of, one of the things that I wish people would get over in terms of the way they get played is when provincial politicians, particularly more so than they used to, um, want to go after Ottawa to s make every fight sound like it's just, it's to the death and the, you know, again, separatism is on the offing. We have to understand that federal provincial disputes in this country are baked in the cake. That's the way it's supposed to work. We used to have these federal provincial get togethers years ago. And yes, the, the provincial leaders are expected to legitimately fight for their provinces. And the federal government fights for the federal principle. But it's nothing, it's not a hill to die on. It's, it's in the nature of a natural dispute because that's the way the system is set up. Um, what we've done in Alberta over the last few years, particularly under Jason Kenney and uh, you know, now with Daniel Smith, is make every fight as though it's a constitutional crisis and we have to pick up you know, pitchforks and, and go to Ottawa. <laughs> that's, that's not the way to get it actually done. Now, much of this, again, is just simply rhetoric. Conservatives in this province, federally and provincially, know that they own this province. Right? And so they'll do whatever. They'll support each other all the way along. The real crisis would come if the federal government was now conservative at some point and they are doing something because they have to defend the federal principle and now Alberta under Smith says, we don't like that. We're going to disavow it. We're going to drop out of it. Now, what does the federal government, a federal conservative government do when they find a province to which they're highly de beholden, vote-wise, someone saying, nah, we don't want to listen to you. <laughs> it's easy right now in this province to keep going after the federal government because they're liberals and we all hate liberals. The problem is when you actually are faced with that dilemma. And that's, that's when it would become interesting between Smith, say, and Rachel Thomas. Trevor, thank you very much for your presentation today. Uh, very, very thought-provoking. I have three questions that I'd just like your comment on. Um, the whole idea about making municipalities lobbyists, I'd like any comments you have on that. And interestingly enough, Rebecca Schultz, the minister there, saying, you know, I don't think we can do that. So that's one thing I'd like you to comment on. Um, traction for the Alberta Party between now and May. Any, what are your thoughts on that? And thirdly, is Smith uh, advocating for the provincial police that Kenny was? Really quickly, one of the chapters actually in uh, the upcoming book is by Ben Henderson, who was a uh, Edmonton councillor. Uh, and so I know he's very much opposed as most councillors are to the idea of introducing party politics 
into municipalities. And his argument is that you can't run things that way. We're talking about sewage disposal. There's no kind of ideological thing here. Just get the job done. Uh, I think it would be actually quite disastrous to do that. However, I think the reason that Smith and some uh, members of UCP are enamored of it is it's the opportunity to introduce more big money and have their people elected. Right? And so you, now you have the echo effect of provincial conservatives now being elected to municipal bodies. I don't think it would work very well. It would be a disaster uh, for, the, uh, for Alberta and its municipalities. Uh, I forget the second question. What was it again? Alberta Party. Oh, the Alberta Party. I think they have no chance right now. The, it is going to polarize between two choices. You have A and you have B. There is no C out there. Um, maybe down the road, maybe. Although I, you know, the NDP, frankly, uh, in law provinces would be viewed as kind of a center of the road liberal party in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, it's not a radical party, despite what Daniel Smith says. <laughs> so the Alberta party, I think, is for now, dead in the water, but who knows down the road, uh, because Wild Rose came up at some point too. The last question was in terms of the prov uh, provincial police. Daniel Smith may still like the idea, but polls show Albertans as a whole do not like the idea. And interesting enough, uh, it's particularly in a lot of rural and small towns that they don't like the idea. So she has said in the past, the people, here's the populist thing, the people should rule, we'll have referendums, blah, blah, blah. If there was a referendum on it, it's not going to pass. Uh, my name is Knut Peterson. Thanks very much for bringing out a huge crowd. Uh, we had Daniel Smith present at SACPA twice back in her heydays of being a Wild Rose leader. And somehow she seemed a little less what, what someone called her bat something crazy. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about how she has progressed or degressed <laughs> since that time? That's a really interesting question. I, and I've given some thought about that uh, at various times in the last several months. Let me say, by the way, this is my 13th time. She was here twice. I win. I win, hands down. Um, uh, when Daniel Smith lost in 2012 uh, as leader of the Wild Rose Party, she afterwards complained that it was really the fringe people, the crazies, who had cost her the election. And, and now the really interesting thing is you bring up, Knud, is that she seems to have gone over to them. Now, is that again just to become leader again? But she's actually coming out with things that would not have been outside of what many of the people back in 2012 would have said. Um, I, I can't speak to her what's gone on with her, but there does seem to be a kind of a change there because she would have at one point at least been astute enough to present as a more centrist, moderate, center right kind of politician but now she seems to have gone far far over in terms of that wild rose faction of 2012 so it's it's a mystery i suspect many people leona jacobs so i'm curious as to your thoughts with respect to how uh, you think daniel smith is going to reconcile um the whole issue of governance in Alberta and being premier and hopefully winning, well, not hopefully for me, but for her, hopefully winning the election, versus um, the takeover of the UCP board by the extremists in the party, and also a comment on the rejection of the candidate in the Livingston McLeod riding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leon. Uh, those two questions are actually very much linked together. Uh, because, and again, this goes back to, in some sense, the previous question. The party wants to be saleable to the broad swath of Alberta voters, but some of these people are probably not very saleable. Now, they may win in their individual ridings, but the 
uh, the presentation of a candidate in an individual riding also colors the way the party is looked at as a whole across the province. So that is a bit of a problem. In the case of Livingston McLeod, uh, who now have no candidate apparently at all because the previous MLA stepped down saying basically it was going to be a fixed nomination meeting, he wasn't going to win, and he couldn't support the person who was going to win. That person then, uh, the, the board has basically said even though by acclamation she would have won, they're saying she's not, they're not going to uh, process her nomination. However, the change in the UCP board when those new members come on in January, I think it's January, uh, they are just as likely to turn around and say, we approve that nomination. So I suspect the uh, candidate who is a previous People's Party of Canada candidate uh, will be the official uh, person running in that, that riding uh, after January. Maureen Hawkins, thank you, Trevor. Um, you're always helpful. My, my question is, if Smith goes ahead with the Sovereignty Act or, and is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court or any of the other things that they've talked about, like stealing RCPP for aim code of squander, can we expect her to invoke the notwithstanding clause, as Ford has just done, even though he backed off? Yeah. Uh, really interesting question. Uh, again, the, uh, in terms of Alberta voters, if you p went to a plebiscite, uh, Albertans do not want anybody to mess with, mess with their pensions. And this for the UCP is actually uh, a bit of a concern because much of their voting base is probably a bit older, so they, you know, they don't want to annoy people who have pensions. Uh, and so it would not pass if it again went to a referendum. Um, in the, the, the Sovereignty Act part, see, by the time the Supreme Court actually ruled on it, and I think they would rule many parts of it are invalid, uh, ultra-virus, as they use Latin here, get really fancy. Um, the, uh, by the time they actually ruled on it, it would be some years down the road. So, in other words, you could win an election on it, and it would be totally bogus again. So it's kind of one of those rhetorical tropes you can throw out there to get elected, but you know it's not going to fly. So that's, that's always a possibility. On the other hand, if it was actually ruled uh, as by the Supreme Court you could do it, using the notwithstanding clause, and we could almost have another sad pop to talk about that one, that's where what Ford did and, and backed off the other day I think was in a really important event because what Ford was doing, what Quebec's been doing is increasingly it looks like uh, provincial governments are quite willing to gut the charter of rights and freedoms on a political whim just for their own power that we're going to use it and that's incredibly dangerous and so when I heard that Ford was going to do that in Ontario that was my first thought was okay given that precedent would a Daniel Smith-led government here choose to use that for any number of things, just say, we're king, that's what we've decided, right? So very, very <laughs> dangerous. And we haven't heard probably the end of that. I suspect the notwithstanding clause is going to continue to come forward. And really right now the only counter to it is citizen action. Right? It's, it's really only finally the, the people in Ontario who turned it back. Uh, that it was a fairly vast growing movement said, no, this far, no further. Trevor, we have one last question for you. And then um, after your question, I wonder if you have a takeaway for all of us, okay? <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Kent Peacock, University of Lethbridge. Very good talk. I'd like to ask about something quite different which is the importance of religion in all of this. So um, Kenny himself is a very conservative Catholic. I have no idea what Daniel Smith's 
religious persuasions are unless libertarianism is itself a form of religion, right? But that's my question. How important is religion in all of this? Uh, that is a great question. And again, promo for my book. Uh, Jillian, Jillian Stewart, who was a, uh, a formerly a, a journalist with the Calgary Herald and held various posts, agreed to write a chapter for the book, particularly looking at religion. And I kind of tweaked her to it. I said, I think there's something going on here that you should look at. And so she's written one of the chapters. Uh, there is a religious component to the UCP membership. Uh, certainly, you look at, for example, the support for um, faith-based universities, financial support, the uh, support for uh, private um, charter schools and everything else. The, much of this, there's kind of, if not overtones, undertones of religiosity. And you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Jason Kenney is a very devout Catholic. Uh, Daniel Smith, as far as I haven't read that she has a uh, strong religious belief, she's, I think, firmly a libertarian in that regard, so I don't know that she has any particular belief. She's never spoken about them. So she may be very secular in, in that way. Um, before closing off, I do just, there was a gentleman asked me before I ever talked, asked me a quick question, I'm just going to answer, try to answer briefly. Liz Truss in the UK Absolutely. and and Daniel Smith. And th it has struck me that there's a really interesting comparison here. And the comparison, and this is something for parliamentary or government systems as a whole. Liz Truss was voted in even though the party establishment thought she was not winnable. Uh, and she had no support of the MPs by a mass uh, uh, membership. Um, and a lot of parties have gone to this because they want to engage their membership in this. The problem becomes how is the person that the membership picks saleable to a larger group of people outside of the membership? Okay, so here it becomes the comparison again with Daniel Smith. As I showed in the, uh, the numbers, the stats from when she was selected, she was picked by a membership that is not representative of Albertans as a whole. If the people in cabinet had been asked, who do you want to be leader? It would have been Taves. He had most of the support of the ministers and possibly, possibly Gene. But for sure, Taves would have won. So there's a conflict within the party between the executive, the administrative heart of the party, and the membership itself. And this is actually a struggle that every political party is dealing with across Canada and elsewhere right now. Uh, the control of the executive versus the broad membership. Anyway, thanks again to all of you for coming out. It's been wonderful. I enjoyed it as usual. So. Thank you, Trevor, for your talk and for everyone that came up and asked a question. Um, do you have a takeaway for us as the audience before we all leave? Final takeaway. Uh, be involved, uh, make yourself knowledgeable about the arguments, don't fall for the, the rhetoric of politicians, and, uh, and press them. Don't let them get away with giving mealy-mouthed answers to things. Uh, really press them on what do you mean. Uh, the only, the best guide is George Orwell used to say to actually preserving democracy and preventing uh, authoritarianism is the use of language. And if we fail to use language properly, then we will find ourselves in a serious, undemocratic mess. So thank you again. Thank you.